Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. So today's video is something a little bit different for me. I am doing a vlog style mid-month wrap up. I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the first half of April, but I'm going to do it as a vlog. And the reason for this is that I am traveling right before the middle of the month to go to my brother's wedding and I will be unable to film a traditional wrap up. So you are getting this video a couple days early and in a completely different format. Hopefully this works out and you enjoy it. So it is April 1st. I just got done filming my super long March end of month wrap up and I have one book that I need to talk about that I've already finished. You can expect a clip from me every time I finish a book. I may not look this put together when I'm doing all the clips but that that's fine. The one thing that I finished so far in April is a short story. This is called Stag by Karen Russell. If you saw my March wrap up, you might know that at the very end of the month, I started reading this collection of short stories that were put together by Amazon. These are available for free for people with Kindle Unlimited, which is something that I have, including the audiobook, which is great. And what they'll do is they'll create these collections where they gather together some amazing authors and give them some kind of a prompt. So in this case there were six short stories from different authors all touching on wild animals and human survival in different ways. Five of those short stories I read at the end of March so if you want to hear my thoughts on those I will link my end of month wrap up up above. You can go check them out there but the sixth story I read today and unfortunately this was also my least favorite of the collection and kind of an odd one given given the rest of them. So Stag is a short story that feels like it's trying real hard to be deep and literary but feels like exactly the kind of thing that we see all the time that I'm kind of turned off to. It's funny because some people seem to like this better than the other ones that I prefer that have more kind of like weird elements or open endings. This is like more I guess what people expect from literary short stories. But the main character is a middle-aged man who is sad and kind of crabby. You haven't seen that before. Very, very novel. So it's kind of weird. This anonymous man attends a divorce party is this a thing people actually do? Do people actually have divorce parties or did she make this up? I guess there are people who probably do this. Why? Why? Weird. So weird. Anyway, he attends this divorce party with a younger woman he met in Las Vegas as her plus one because she just broke up with her boyfriend and it's got this kind of surrealist quality to it and at the party there is a large tortoise that the couple had rescued as a pet and it was supposed to be symbolic of their long-term love that is now breaking apart. I, I just, like, I, I didn't care. <laughs> like, I didn't, I didn't care. I didn't care about the characters. I didn't care about this, like, sad man. I gave it two stars. Um, yeah, this just feels like every other navel gazy sad white lit thick thing but in short form so yeah two stars like the actual quality of the prose is perfectly fine i just didn't care about the story so i would recommend all of the other five stories i think the lowest rating i gave to any of the others was four stars and that was just for two that i thought should have been longer but uh yeah this was definitely for me at least the weakest in the collection two stars i will be back once i have finished another book Hello, it is April 3rd and I'm here to update you on the second book that I read so far this month. Was it one that was actually on my TBR? No. <laughs> it was an audiobook that I've been meaning to listen to and I needed something fun and light that wasn't going to require a ton of brain power while I did other things. So this worked perfectly. I listened to Temper Me by Alexandria House. This is a contemporary romance. It's a second chance romance. So this does have flashbacks to it. And it follows two characters who are a little bit older. A single mom who recently got divorced from her much older husband. And the guy who broke her heart in college because he didn't want to be tied down. But now he's 40. He recently recovered from a bout with cancer and reconnected 
connects with the woman that he let get away. So this was really good. It's definitely steamy. It follows their past of their relationship and their current relationship. And a lot of it is them unpacking their baggage and finding love together, which is lovely. So I really like this. Alexandria House has been a little hit and miss for me. Like sometimes I really enjoy what she's doing and sometimes she does stuff that's just personally not my favorite thing in romance. This one I really liked. I gave it four stars. If you are an Audible user, I would recommend it. It's an Audible original, so she created it for Audible and it's only available there, but it is included in the Audible Plus catalog. So if you're an Audible Plus member, you do have access to it. I liked it. The narrators are fantastic. It's a Denrelay Ojo and Jacoby Diem, who are just wonderful audio narrators. So so I liked that quite a lot. Book two of the month, I will check back in once I've finished something else. Part of why I think it's taking me longer than usual is I'm working my way through kind of a long classic, and so that's been taking up a lot of my attention. Plus I've been working on getting videos filmed and edited, but uh, more to come soon. Hello everybody, it is April 4th and I have two more books to talk about. Also, the reason I have not put makeup on in a couple days is uh I was out with my children and tripped and fell and like hurt my hand they're fine it's fine it's just the band-aids don't want to stay on <sighs> anyway um okay so I have finished two more books so let's talk about them first up is the classic I mentioned at the end of the last clip I was reading The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe this is a classic that I have been wanting to read for years, ever since I knew it existed when I read Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, which references this. And this book is really interesting. I'm glad that I finally got around to reading it. In some ways, it's very much a product of its time, but it, like, I'm, I'm glad I read it. There, there's a lot that's really fascinating here. So this is one of the first gothic romances, and it was wildly popular. Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen is kind of a satirical take on the gothic romance, and the heroine in that book is specifically reading Mysteries of Udolpho. This book came out in the late 1700s, and we have a young woman who is our heroine, who is tragically orphaned, and then imprisoned in a castle by a villain who has married her aunt and is trying to like weasel his way into the family fortunes. There are potentially haunted castles and maybe supernatural things and creepy moments and like people trying to force her to get married when she doesn't want to and being separated from the man that she actually loves. It, it, it's all very thrilling and melodramatic and fun. And then is punctuated by lots of poetry and these long descriptions of beautiful landscapes. I don't actually mind the landscapes, the poetry, I can kind of take or leave, but yeah, it's, it's a very interesting book. It is long. It's about 650 pages, and I did listen to this on audio, but I'm glad that I finally got around to it. I think as somebody who is really into gothic novels, this was one that I knew I should get around to reading at some point. And, you know, I have to say there are certain things about it that I find really interesting because you see themes in things that were scary for young women back then that in different sorts of ways are still scary now or like have similar coping mechanisms. There's a guy who is obsessed with our heroine and wants to marry her and she's being pushed into a forced marriage with him but she does not want to marry him and there's a scene where in the middle of the night he shows up in her bedchamber and she's freaked out, rightfully so, and nothing happens, probably because this was written in the 1700s, but clearly the underlying threat is a violent one there and what I think is interesting is that she around that time has a conversation with her aunt who is kind of self-centered but also stands up for herself a lot more and like pushes back and it gets her into trouble with her husband that she chose to marry. And the niece basically is like, look, you need to play nice or you're gonna get yourself killed. Like she doesn't use those words but that's basically it. That like 
the way you stay safe as a woman in the situation where you don't have a lot of power is you smile and be nice and try to push off having to make decisions you don't want to make. And I just find that really interesting because I think this is still a thing that a lot of women do when they're in an uncomfortable situation with somebody who feels dangerous, who is into them, they will smile and play nice because they are trying to save their lives. And like, you know, maybe it's not forced marriages to some Italian nobleman who's a creep, but in other ways, we're still doing the same things. Anyway, I found this to be a very interesting book. I enjoyed it. It was a bit long and a little convoluted at times. This is like a three and a half to four star read for me. I didn't love it, but I did like it and I'm happy that I read it. So there you go. Mysteries of Udolfo. Also, I'm really happy to finally be able to check this off my TBR for the year. This was on my classics TBR last year and I didn't get to it, so I was determined to get to it this year and I did, so yay. I'm thinking three and a half stars for this one. The other book that I finished is a contemporary romance that was not originally on my TBR, but then I found out about this like smutty romance book club that happens in my city and I was like, man, I would love to actually have a social life from time to time. Maybe I can just hurry up and read the book that they're reading this month. And so I did. So this is Sex Coach by M.S. Parker. It was available on Kindle Unlimited, so very easy to get a hold of and a very quick read. Wow, this was steamy, like very erotic, much more than most of the romances I typically pick up. So I guess heads up that may be positive or negative depending on your taste and what you prefer in your books. I wasn't entirely sure how I was going to feel about it, but I ended up really liking this. This book does some interesting things in terms of character work. While this book is super erotic, it is partially using that as a way to do some really interesting character work. So the basic premise of this is our hero is a male prostitute who is known for being being able to give women multiple orgasms, okay? And our heroine is a freelance writer who gets asked to step in for another writer who was in an accident and take over an article that she was writing where she was going to be interviewing this guy and writing an article about how women can be multi-orgasmic. So the book follows the two of them meeting, having instant chemistry, and him like seriously putting the moves on her and and her sort of breaking out of her shell and finally facing some of the trauma that she has in her past that she hadn't dealt with. He also has a traumatic backstory and so what's interesting about this book is that for both of them while it starts out as just being about sex and for her maybe exploring a side of herself that she hadn't before, it ends up turning into a lot more and it ends up becoming a pathway to both of them facing their trauma and finding love where they didn't necessarily think they could find it or in ways that they thought they could find it. So yeah, this was a surprisingly beautiful love story, but along the way there are a lot of a lot of sexy times going on. One thing you should know though is that there is a content warning for flashbacks to and discussions of sex abuse by a family member when she was a teenager. And so that's one of the big sort of traumatic things. There's also content warnings for loss of loved ones, loss of parents and some other stuff, but that's that's like the big thing to be aware of going in. I do think it's interesting though, because this book ends up having some like BDSM elements to it, but it uses it as a way of working through trauma which I know is a thing that some people do. So yeah, I ended up liking this quite a lot. I think it's gonna be a four star read for me. Definitely a lot steamier than the kinds of romance I typically pick up, um, but kind of a pleasant surprise and I'm excited to go and talk to other people about it in person and not just virtually, <laughs> cause I'm not, I have not been good about doing that. I, I mean, I wasn't great about it even pre pandemic, but certainly since. So yeah, if that sounds up your alley, maybe check it out. It is on Kindle Unlimited. I am in progress on several books right now, so I will check back in once I have finished another one. It is April 5th and I finished another book. This time it was a kind of last minute audio review copy that I got from Neck Alley. This is for Spear by Nicola Griffith. This was fantastic. It's coming out really soon. It comes out in April, so as this is going up it should be out in like a week or two. And wow, it's a gender-bent 
queer Arthurian retelling. Not focused as much on Arthur himself, but on somebody who ends up becoming a knight or companion to Arthur, except in this case it's a mysterious young woman with magic who is living as a man. It was really good. The writing is gorgeous. It's clear that the author has done a ton of research and like knows the legends both historically and from fiction very well. And I thought this brought a really interesting spin to it. It's got magical elements. It's got some sapphic relationships in it. And again, just really stunning prose. So if this has been on your radar at all, definitely worth picking up. For me, this was five stars. One other thing that's kind of cool to note if you are an audiobook listener is that the author reads it herself and actually does an amazing job authors <laughs> authors of fiction reading their books themselves is kind of hit and miss. I've seen some examples of where it's gone really wrong, but in this case I think Nicola Griffith did an incredible job narrating the audiobook, so I would recommend it if that sounds up your alley. So yeah, this was definitely a hit, five stars, and I'm glad I read it. It's April 6th and I finished reading another book. This is Don't Go Baking My Heart by N.G. Peltier. This is coming out I believe in June. It's the second book in a contemporary romance series that started with Sweet Hand last year. I read Sweet Hand last year because of Jess Owens and I absolutely loved it. It completely worked for me. This one I had a little bit more mixed feelings about but honestly I think how much you're going to enjoy this is going to have a lot to do with the tropes that you enjoy and the character types that you enjoy in your romance. This one is definitely opposites attract with a bubbly super chaotic heroine and a buttoned up hyper controlled hero. She brings chaos into his life but maybe he needs a little bit of it while she's teaching him how to bake and things get very steamy. I did like this. I did end up liking the way that it explored each character's background and what made them who they were and the things that they needed to work through to finally like let each other in and find love. So I liked it but I didn't like it as much as Sweet Hand. I think for me part of it is just that our heroine was so chaotic. <laughs> it kind of stressed me out. She like grew on me by the end. I did end up liking her. But like, I don't know, there were there were things that she did that I was like, oh my god, I could not like I could not deal with that level of chaos from a significant other in my life. But you know, that's completely a me thing. And I think a lot of people are really enjoying this. And some people seem to be liking it even more than they did Sweet Ham. So your mileage on this is really going to vary. One thing I will say, though, is I didn't love the pacing of this book. It has kind of the same issue I had with Sweet Hand. My only real complaint about that was I felt like the ending wrapped up too quickly. And I would say that the same thing is true here, except that in addition, it felt to me like it dragged through the earlier part of the book a bit. So I do wish the pacing had been a little bit more even with like a slightly shorter lead up to the romance and then a longer ending because the last couple chapters of the book a lot happens very quickly and we just don't get enough time with them being together and being a couple like it's just a matter of pages and so I wanted more than that. One thing that I do think is cool about the series is it's set in Trinidad. The author is also from Trinidad and so a lot of the food and the culture and I think even some like slang and turns of phrase that I'm not familiar with as an American are integrated into this book and so that aspect of it I did really like. So overall for me this was a like but didn't love but again I think your mileage is really going to vary depending on the tropes you enjoy. For those reasons, I ended up giving this book three stars. I do appreciate the author for sending an early copy for review. Again, I believe this one comes out in June if you're interested. It is April 8th and I finally finished reading Empire of Silence by Christopher Riocchio. This was a tome, um, but I ended up really enjoying it. I had this on my list of books that I wanted to read for the year and we're also planning on doing a podcast episode about it pretty soon, so I needed to get to it. 
Liana at Liana's Library is the one who convinced me to pick this up because she's a huge fan of the series and I can see why. This is the first book in a epic space opera series that has a lot of like Dune meets Name of the Wind vibes which it's interesting looking at the reviews. Some people see that there's some influence from those but it makes it its own thing and like that. Other people are like this is super derivative and don't like it. So your mileage on this may vary. I can definitely see some similarities in the world building, in uh, some of the characterization and structure, but I think it does make it very much its own thing. And if you like Dune and you like Name of the Wind, this might work out well for you. Not a perfect book for me. I did have some quibbles with it. If you want to check out my Goodreads review, I it's always linked in the, my Goodreads is always linked in the video description down below and you can do that. But overall, I found this to be really interesting and compelling. It's framed as this man who ends up being a notorious hero who's loved and hated for various reasons, telling his story years in the future, right? So we have a vague understanding of maybe some of the things he's done, who he's become, and this is where the framing is a little similar to Name of the Wind because that's sort of how it's framed as well. But then we go back and we see him as a young man growing up in a wealthy family, very privileged, fighting with his brother, and then things kind of go downhill from there. He ends up living on the streets with next to nothing. He fights as a gladiator. Other things happen. He discovers some things about a mysterious alien race. So th that's kind of like the overarching plot without giving a ton of detail, but we're following those parts of his story and we're barely even scratching the surface. I mean, there's several books in the series and I think we're eventually going to see how he ends up being who he is, but this is just the beginning. I do think it's really interesting. It's got a lot of cool sci-fi elements to it. It's exploring ideas about what is humanity? What does it mean to be human? There's a lot of like genetic engineering stuff and some interesting rules about high technology where there's a church that controls access to certain types of technology and disallows them. One thing that is a little similar to Dune is that the church doesn't allow computers and so there are people trained to act as computers and hold high amounts of memory, sort of like Mentats in the Dune series, which is interesting. Overall, I liked it. There were parts of it that dragged, but generally I had a good time. I'm interested in the world. I'm curious to see where this is gonna go. I didn't always like the main character, but I think that's okay. I'm, I'm very curious to see where his journey is gonna take him because he is this person who has a lot of privilege and I think doesn't always recognize how even when he is in the worst of circumstances, he has options and he has things that have made things easier for him because of his background in comparison to the other people around him. And I feel like the author is aware of that, even if the character isn't, but I'm not totally sure. So I'm, I'm curious to see where that goes. I appreciated the fact that the author seems to demonstrate some awareness of power dynamics in romantic relationships and avoids some of the major traps of misogyny. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say that this is like the best example of a guy writing female characters in terms of them being fully fleshed out. Like I wouldn't go that far, but there are moments where it definitely demonstrates an understanding of like why it is inappropriate for a man with a lot of power over a woman to initiate a sexual relationship when she can't really say no, for instance. Like that's a thing that happens that the, the main character realizes. So there, there's like some attention to those kinds of things. And I think there is an attempt to write female characters who some of them feel a little bit nuanced. Again, it's a mixed bag. Like the female characters aren't like, oh, amazing. He's writing incredible female characters, at least at this point. But like, you know, they're not bad, which is great. Some of them have some interest and nuance to them. I also like the fact that this is a world where people can casually be queer. The main character is not, but his mother is, other characters are, and it's kind of no big deal. People don't really care, especially because the highborns like them are like grown in vats anyway and genetically manipulated. So like, it, it, yeah, marriages of political convenience don't necessarily have to involve sexual relationships. Anyway, it's a really interesting book. There are some open-ended questions about these alien races that I'm curious to see where that's gonna take us. I do wanna continue with the series and I ended up giving this book four stars. 
Good morning. It is Saturday, April 9th. I'm drinking my coffee and I have finished two books that I want to tell you about. Neither of these were on my TBR for the month, but they were books that had been kind of on my TBR more broadly. So first I listened to Black Buck by Matteo Ascarapur. This I had as an audio influencer copy from Libra FM. They provide a small selection of free audiobooks to influencers every month, and this is one that I got a while back last year when it came out and just hadn't gotten around to it, but I had wanted to and I'd heard kind of mixed things about it and reading it I can understand why. There are things I really like about this book and for most of this book I was like oh this is great I am loving it. The ending goes a little off the rails and gets kind of bizarre in a way that I'm not sure worked as well as the rest of the book but people people are mixed on it. Black Buck is about a young black man who ends up working in corporate sales, like high-end startup culture sales. And this is after him having been plucked out of working in a Starbucks for four years and trying to help take care of his mom who's having some health issues and kind of his being pushed into this extremely white, toxic, hyper-competitive situation and what that does to him. A lot of it is really interesting. There are so many moments of like horrific racist undertones and microaggressions that he deals with. There's a lot of abusiveness in the way that people are trained, some overtly racist comments made. But what we see is him almost getting brainwashed by this company. And it, it is a wild, wild ride and it mirrors things that really do happen and the ways that startup culture sometimes talks about their stuff and it almost feels like a cult in some ways. So yeah, it's very interesting commentary on that entire world of things. A lot of it I think is done really well. Like I said, I don't want to spoil it, but I felt like the ending went a little bit off the rails. I mean, the whole book is a little bit wild, but the ending really... I don't know. Like, I get the message of the book, and that, I guess, is positive. I don't know. I have mixed feelings about this one. I can't decide what I want to rate it. I feel like it's, like, in a th right in that, like, three and a half to four star range. So probably once I sit down and actually write my review for Goodreads, I'll nail down how I feel about it. I kind of want to look at other people's reviews, to be honest, as well. This is one where I I'm kind of left thinking, how do I feel about this book? I don't, I don't know. I'd be really curious if any of you guys have read Black Buck and you have thoughts on it. But I like my face listening to this audiobook, there were multiple moments where I was like, oh my god, like what just happened? I mean, even there's like little stuff like, oh my god, like they they give everybody nicknames on their first day of work and they name him Buck because he worked at Starbucks. But like the racial undertones of that and like are awful. And the first time he sits down at his desk, they play a prank on him where they dump white paint all over him. I just like, wow, it's a lot. It's and it, things get worse from there. But um yeah, this was a, a trip to read. So I wouldn't steer people away from it. I think it's worth reading. I'm just not totally sure how I feel about the direction that some of the things took. But it is interesting commentary on racism in the workplace and in that corporate type of culture. Yeah, that was wild. Then I picked up a poetry collection. This is Wild Embers by Nikita Gill. This has been on my TBR for a while and I finally was like, you know what, let me go ahead and read this. I'd read another poetry collection from her before and really enjoyed it. I think I liked that one better than this, but there were parts of this that I really liked. She writes a lot of feminist poetry that is unpacking things like female archetypes in fairy tales and mythology and getting past trauma and abuse, the way children are raised in misogynistic culture. And there's a lot that I really like here. Some of them hit better than others. So I feel like I'm probably going to land again in that like three and a half to four star range. I didn't like this quite as much as her, what was it? I think Fierce Fairy Tales was the other collection I read from her. That one I really loved. This one, I had stronger feelings about some parts of the collection than others. But overall, I liked it and I'm glad I read it. So that is my update. I feel like this might be a weird angle, but um, this, this is what we have this morning. <laughs> 
Hello, it is the evening of April 10th and I just got done reading a book that I am also vlogging. So if you haven't seen this weekend reading vlog for the book I'm about to talk about, I will link it up above. I read Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots or Walscots or something like that. Yeah, this was a ride. Again, I don't want to say too much because I do have the reading vlog available if you want to see this. This is one that my patrons had voted on for me to read. It was not a book that had been on my TBR, so they like picked it and voted for it. Otherwise, I doubt I would have picked it up. I was a little nervous going in because traditionally I've not done great with superhero books that aren't based on an existing franchise like Marvel or DC for instance, but you know patrons voted on it so we did it. This was a roller coaster of a book for me. I ended up liking it a lot more than I thought I would for most of it and then the last like 30% of the book took a sharp turn and I did not like <laughs> where it went. It kind of went off the rails for me. So something that had been more positive than I was anticipating and ended up not being as great as I think it could have been. I think this book had potential but it made some interesting choices towards the end. The basic premise is it follows a woman who's working for a temp agency and through the temp agency is working as a low-level henchman for supervillains and ends up kind of getting caught in the crossfire with a superhero, has a severe injury, and starts hating superheroes and gets really into the data and numbers on the damage and harm that superheroes cause. So a lot of what this book is doing is unpacking what really makes somebody a hero versus a villain and how much of that is just about optics and power and PR, the harm and the damage that they do and like are they net beneficial to people. So that's some of the things that the book is exploring which I think is interesting but again towards the end it kind of like goes off the rails and has all this like torture body horror stuff and didn't have a very satisfying conclusion. So I'm thinking this book is going to be like a three star read for me. That's how I'm feeling at the moment. I need to sit down and actually write out my review. But I'm, I'm thinking three stars. For most of it I was thinking oh yeah this would be like a four star read. I'm really liking it even if it's a little slow at parts. But that ending just... I yeah I don't know. That was that was interesting. If you want to hear more check out the reading vlog. It is April 11th and I have finished two more books so let's talk about them. The one that I have been in progress with the longest is The Way to Rio Luna by Zoraida Cordova and the reason for this is not that it took me a long time to read, it's that I started out reading it with my kid. We got about halfway through it and then he kind of lost steam and hadn't read chapters in several weeks and I was finally like okay I want to finish this book so I decided to go ahead and just go ahead and finish it and then whenever he decides to get back to this one we'll discuss it. This was not one of Zoraida Cordova's better books. It had things I liked about it and I liked what it was trying to do but I didn't love the pacing or some of the narrative choices. This is a middle grade fantasy adventure story following a boy who is in the foster care system whose older sister had run away. But he's convinced that she's in Rio Luna, this magical land, from the book that they used to read together. And he's determined to do whatever he can to find her and track her down and get back his sister. So he ends up meeting a friend, finding out magic is real, and they kind of hop to different places in the globe trying to figure out a way into Rio Luna. The problem is I thought a lot of the first half of the book really dragged. It took a while for the action to actually get going, for anything super interesting to be happening, which especially for a middle grade book you kind of want things to get going faster. The second half of the book was much more fast paced, a lot more happened quickly, but for a book that's about this alternate magical world we don't spend more than a few pages in that world. And while it's kind of cool that they travel to like Ecuador and Brazil and stuff like that, it would have been nice to also have have them be in this fantasy world. I suspect that this book was originally intended to be the start of a series because it doesn't read like a standalone. The ending is not super satisfying as a standalone but it you know it came out a couple years ago and at least thus far I don't think 
we're getting any more in the series. So I feel like this was probably intended to be the beginning of a series where maybe in book two we would have gotten more time in that alternate universe, but we didn't here. So kind of a mixed bag for me. I ended up landing on three stars for this one. Then I finished what is easily my favorite thing that I have read so far this month, A Caribbean Heiress in Paris by Adriana Herrera. This was just as good as I hoped it was gonna be, and I had very high hopes. I love Adriana Herrera, but this is her first full-length historical novel. She's written a lot of contemporary romances that I always really love because they're diverse and socially conscious and super steamy, and I was excited to see what she was gonna do with a historical novel, and I think she knocked it out of the park, and I am very excited for the rest of the books in the series. This book is set in 1889, and it follows a Dominican woman who travels to Paris for the sort of world exposition where the Eiffel Tower was first unveiled. She owns a rum distillery and so she is there to sell her rum and also go on a girls trip with some of her friends who are going to get their own books later on in the series which I'm very excited about. One of them is sapphic which is fun too for historical and so while setting up her table to present her rum she encounters a Scottish nobleman who is there to show off his scotch whiskey from the distillery that he owns and sparks pretty immediately fly. I really loved this. It has a lot of history in it and you will learn things. That part of it was really interesting. It was very well researched. In that sense it reminds me a little bit of reading a Beverly Jenkins novel where you're learning a lot about the history of people of color in ways that you maybe didn't hear in the classroom. You're getting the same thing here. It's clearly very well researched. We get a lot of history and I think that's really fascinating but it's also very steamy which not too surprising given that it's Adriana Herrera. I would say this is definitely more steamy than most Beverly Jenkins novels you're gonna get. It is a little bit slower getting there than her contemporary novels. You don't get too much steam until about halfway through the book but then things really pick up and you get a big payoff and it is quite sexy for the latter half of the book. There is a marriage of convenience. We have a fiery heroine who is very confident and determined in what she wants. We have kind of a protective alpha type hero where he might have a tendency to be a little bit possessive or a little bit protective, but our heroine quickly puts a stop to anything that goes too far and they end up having this great relationship. I really loved this. So if you were looking for well-researched historical romance that is centering women of color and isn't afraid to tackle thorny issues like, for instance, the fact that any wealthy nobleman of the time who's inherited generational wealth probably has some of that money rooted in the slave trade. And this book tackles things like that. It also tackles microaggressions. And they have some frank conversations as a couple and how to handle that. Excellent, excellent. This is exactly what I hoped we would get from an Adriana Herrera. In her contemporaries she does these great steamy socially conscious diverse books and we're getting the same thing from her in a historical novel. I love it. I'm very excited to see what else we're gonna get in the series. One of my favorite books that I read this year and I did give this six stars which in my personal rating scale is a favorite of the year. So yeah this was a big winner. Absolutely loved it. It comes out in May check it out. Here is the beautiful finished cover with our heroine Lou Zalana. I will probably be trying to get my hands on a finished copy, but thank you so much to Adriana Herrera for sending me this arc for review. I loved it. It was everything I wanted it to be. It is April 13th and I finished two more books so let's talk about them. The first one was a bit of a disappointment. I read A Mirror Amended by Alexi e. Harrow. This is a novella that's coming out I believe in June and it is the second book in a series that I think is actually only going to be a duology which is kind of a bummer. Anyway I have, I have thoughts about this. This is a follow-up to A Spindle Splintered which came out last year. Now look I loved A Spindle Splintered. It's this fun snarky feminist interesting take on the Sleeping Beauty story that is interrogating the history of mythology, pushing back on ableism. It was fantastic. It totally worked. The premise of this follow-up novella sounded great where we have our heroine falling for the evil queen except maybe trying to unpack what it really means for women in fairy tales to be evil and what kinds of situations they end up finding themselves in. And look I didn't 
hate this book. I had a reasonably good time reading most of it. The tone is still fun and snarky. It's got elements of pulling apart mythology that I like and enjoy, but as a story where we have the same heroine that we had in our first novella, I'm not sure that it really does anything to move her narrative arc forward. Like I got to the end of it and I was like, okay, parts of that were fun, but this was very lackluster and I'm not sure what that story did for us or why we needed it. There is sort of a sapphic romance, but again, it's pretty lackluster. I liked the idea of it more than I actually liked the execution of it, which is unfortunate. This was just very meh, very middle of the road. I didn't actively dislike it, but I didn't have strong positive feelings about it either. I don't feel like it's something that's going to leave a whole lot of an impression. And I'm left wondering why this was the direction that we went and this was the story that we told in this way, especially because she set up this multiversal world that's so interesting where you could go so many different directions with unpacking fairy tales and you could do it for so many different fairy tales, but apparently we're ending with this one. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like if you read A Spindle Splintered and you really loved it, this might still be worth reading. I would just temper your expectations. I don't think it's nearly as good as book one. It wasn't terrible, but I went in with really high expectations and it was just okay. I ended up giving this one two and a half stars and I rounded up to three on Goodreads. The other book that I finished reading was my reread of The Temple of the Winds by Terry Goodkind. This is for the Sort of Truth read-along that myself and Leanna at Leanna's Library are co-hosting this year. Throughout the year we're reading a book a month and uh, this was a reread for me but I hadn't read it in you know more than a decade so it had been a long time. This book gets weird and there is a particular scene that stuck with me that I still remembered, but there was actually a lot about this book that I didn't remember, and it's pretty interesting. I actually really liked it. Yes, this book is weird, it is violent, it is dark, but personally we're four books into the series and I would say this is probably my second favorite of all of them which is is saying something. So in this book we basically get a fantasy version of Jack the Ripper. We also get a deadly plague that Caitlin and Richard have to try to stop and it it veers into some some memorably bizarre places that not everybody was a fan of. I don't know, I think it's going to make for a really interesting conversation. So definitely tune in for that over on Leanna's channel. At the end of the month we're going to be talking in depth with spoilers about everything that goes down in this book. But overall I really liked it. I went and wrote initially a very short review on Goodreads and then I was scrolling through and looking at all of the very very negative reviews for this book and was like, what? Okay, I'm gonna go make my review longer and kind of go to bat for this book and why I don't think Terry Goodkind is a misogynist, even if some of his characters are. Anyway, um, so I have thoughts. You can check out my Goodreads review, as always, linked in the video description down below. But I gave this book four stars and I had a good time with it. There is a lot of violence and some disturbing violence and some weird things, but uh, yeah. I liked it. So four stars. And with that said, I am going to wrap up this mid-month wrap up. Hopefully this was fun and interesting and a little bit different with the vlog style, but I need to finish this up and put it up for y'all to watch today because tomorrow I am getting on an airplane and flying to Texas for my brother's wedding. A little different from what you usually get from me, but hopefully you all enjoyed it. Overall, I feel like my reading the first half of the month has been a very mixed bag. I've had some ups and downs, not a lot of new favorites, but you know, some positive things. It's It's been a mix, as you've seen. I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. Let me know your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, tell me about a book that you think should have been a standalone. Maybe that'll be interesting because I feel like A Spindle Splintered, I was very satisfied with the conclusion for our main character at the end of it, and I would have been happy with that being the end of her story. And I, and I don't know that we really needed this second novella focused on her. So tell me what book you think should have been a standalone in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, it does help if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.